So I want you to turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 16. Good morning. Uh, Merry early Christmas. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come. Amen. Y'all excited about Christmas? And, and oh, by the way, Christians, please don't trip over Christmas. We, we all, you know, I mean, because there's some people who can't even smile during Christmas time. Because it's not in the Bible. Okay, just, just put a smile on your face and rejoice today. Pretend like today is Christmas. Amen. And uh, enjoy. Uh, hopefully meditate upon the, uh, the birth of our Lord. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians 16. Anybody excited to be saved today? Yes. Amen. Five people excited to be saved. I know the rest of y'all holding your Bibles in your hand. I got it. I got it. 1 Corinthians 16, and we're going to look at verse 12. We're going to read all the way through the end, and we're going to close it out uh, with the thought, be watchful, stand firm, be strong. Final instructions from this wonderful apostle who by the Spirit has instructed us, and a review, hopefully a little bit of review of what we have learned, um, what we have learned. Oh, by the way, one quick uh, housekeeping note. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, we are having a Christmas Eve service. We'll, uh, we haven't announced it as many times as I'd like because uh, I, I just forgot. But uh, Christmas Eve service will be here at the church. It'll be short. Somebody shout short. short. So we already understand you got Christmas Eve stuff that you do at home. Six to seven, maybe seven, ten. It's going to be a combined service with our two church plants. Christ Chosen will be here. Great Praise will be here. Joint choirs and everything. And so, uh, so they're coming, and uh, Pastor Shelton will be ministering, Pastor Burns will be ministering, I said, and, I, and I gave them sermonettes. I said, I told them, uh, f- uh, five minutes apiece, so we might get ten out of them. <laughs> and then in, interspersed in those sermonettes will be lots of Christmas songs. And then so the goal is to have y'all, you know, literally 7.15, y'all are getting in cars and walking and driving back home and, and enjoying a Christmas Eve. So I want you to come make plans to be here with us. Again, a combined service where the Two churches that are part of us, literally a part of us, are, will be in the building as well. Those great pastors will be here. So please, please, please make plans to be here Christmas Eve, 6 p.m. to about 7, 10-ish, and then we will be done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 12 says, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus uh, were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I just wonder how many of us are devoted to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these And to every fellow worker and laborer, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortuneus and Achaicus. Acacius. Because they have made up for your absence. For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such. Give recognition to such men. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus, amen. Father, thank you for this epistle. Thank you, Lord, for uh, loving us so much that you'd give us this holy scripture to teach us and, and cause us, Lord, to know you better. Thank you, Master, for the changes. Thank you, Lord, for the exhortation. Thank you for the correction. Uh, thank you for all that you've done by your spirit. Now, Father, as you change us and mold us and build us according to the pattern, we're, we're really starting to, to understand the cost of that. It means that we have to die to ourselves. And so, Father, let, let it be so for your own glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you again, and Merry Christmas. I hope you all are enjoying 
uh, yourselves, your Christmas season. Thank you for coming. It is a great blessing that you're here. You all could have chosen some wonderful churches in uh, the city of Chesapeake and Hampton Roads to, to attend today, and you came to CRCC, and you came to CRCC despite all the traffic stuff going on out there. And, uh, you know, it's hard to even get to CRCC, uh, and so, but you came, and I'm, I'm grateful uh, and, and very, very glad. Today, uh, be watchful, stand firm, be strong, is a paraphrase from, obviously, uh, verse number 13, and uh, I just wanted to spend a little time with you in this text and, and, and if I can, be, be really honest with you, uh, because I personally have learned so much uh, in the last literally year and a half that we have walked uh, through this epistle. And then uh, there's a quiz. Just look at your neighbor and say, there's a quiz. As a matter of fact, does everybody have something to write? Well, first of all, does everyone have a copy of the notes? If you don't have a copy of the notes, get, get, put your hand up. We'll ask some, one of the brothers to run and get you a quick copy of the notes. And then, does everybody have something to write with? You'll need something to write with because, you know, there's a quiz. Okay. I thought I'd have a little fun uh, with this today as well. So, uh, you need a copy of the notes and you need something to write with. Now, uh, as we begin to walk through this last section of, of Scripture, uh, understand that we literally started... 1 Corinthians on June the 2nd, 2013. So it has been a journey uh, through this epistle. And how many would, would agree with me that much has changed? Okay, it, it, it really, there's been a lot of change and some of the change, uh, can, I, can we just be honest this morning? Some of the change has been wonderful and then some of the change has been painful. I mean, really deeply painful, and um, that's just the reality. This epistle tested us, and we kind of strutted into it with our soul of scripture itself, and it kind of took us to the woodshed. <laughs> Can you at least agree with me on that one? You know, we came in big, bad, CRCC, Sola. All on the website, sola scripture. We go, we the church that obey the word. We George Jefferson our way in. <laughs> we can maybe, I mean, we kind of did. We yeah, yeah, first Corinthians. What you got, first Corinthians? We done done Ephesians. We done done Philippians. First Corinthians grabbed us by the collar and slammed us up against the wall. So some of the changes. Have, have been great and some of the other things that, that we've had to press through because of just the word ha, have, been, have been challenging. So I want to say at the outset, for all of you that have a mind to allow the word of God to change you. Now, let's be honest. How many of us want the word of God to change us? Can I see your hands? Okay, so I'm talking to you, all right? I admire and I appreciate any Christian this church, other churches, any, anywhere that allows Scripture to change them when they, when they read it. Not everybody does. As a matter of fact, uh, the Lord's brother wrote this, James 1. But be readers of the word. Now, what it says, is it, John? My bad. Let me back up. But be critiquers of the word. But make sure the word is comfortable for you. Y'all okay? But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because what happens when you just hear but don't do? Deceiving who? You actually, this is, the, look at your name, this is no joke this morning. And it's no joke any morning in any church anywhere when the word of God is being preached. Because when you hear it, but don't do it, assuming it's being brought forward correctly, but when you hear it and then don't do it, you actually set yourself up for deception. Anyone who names the name of Christ who can hear the word and go, yeah, that's what it say. That's big time deception. 
And so, again, the Lord's brother writes, but be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. In other words, you look in the mirror, you see the flaws, and by the time you turn away from the mirror, you're okay with it. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no longer or being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who, CRCC, are y'all alive? Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who, he will be blessed in his doing. This is the challenge for every Christian, every place, everywhere. And so when talking about this particular epistle, uh, Pastor Rodney and I are joking around a little bit in the office this week. He said, we've been through the fire and we've been through the blood. To that I say, amen. Some of you might be wondering why we take Scripture in these large pieces like this. Well, this is review. Uh, we believe that there's a power in expository preaching, that there's a real there's real honest kingdom growth that happens when we set God's agenda above our own. And so here's some, some old lessons. You've probably heard this before. Uh, I, I got these many years ago from John MacArthur, who taught me through one of his books in this area. And it says, number one, expository preaching expresses exactly the will of God, allowing God to speak and not man. Isn't that what we want? In, don't we want to hear from God? Number two, expository preaching retains the thoughts and intents of the Holy Spirit. In other words, who, the one who laid out the Scripture, get, what, what did he intend to happen? How did he intend for our lives to be? What did he intend to happen in worship? How did he intend for church to be? So when we, when we look at all of what he said, we're more likely to figure out his intent, not our own. Number three, expository preaching frees the preacher to proclaim all the revelation of God, producing a ministry of wholeness and integrity. In other words, it doesn't become Carlton's church. It doesn't become Dennis's church. It doesn't become Bobby's church. It doesn't become Rodney's church. But you walk in, and as one brother texted me this week from another church who just stopped by, there's the sweet aroma of Jesus. Because, quote, somebody was play, praying in that place. Very encouraging. Number four, expository preaching promotes bi 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 biblical literacy. Can't talk this morning. Biblical literacy, yielding rich knowledge of redemptive truths. In other words, you've got to dig in to figure it out. And I know for a fact that 1 Corinthians has made some of y'all study. That's a good thing. Number five, expository preaching transforms the preacher, leading to transformed congregations because in any environment, as the leadership goes, so goes the the, the, the organization, whether it's family, whether it's government, whether it's church, whatever. And so prayerfully, the eldership team is transformed and we're not walking in deception. Now, way back in on June the 2nd, 2013, we kind of prophesied a bit. Of course, we didn't think of that then. But this is what we wrote about the implications of what could happen or might happen as we walk through this, uh, this epistle. Number one, we said that we take Scripture in large sections ultimately because we want this church and our lives. Now, this is what we said. Now, as, we, as you read the words, you, you, you kind of come to, because remember, we're going to do some quizzing here in a minute. So let's get started early. You start to think about whether or not this is truly what you want. And don't, just, don't quickly say amen here, because one of the things I have learned from 1 Corinthians is not everybody who says, Lord, Lord. One of the things that I've learned from, from walking through Scripture like this over a period of years even is that, is that not everybody who says, I really want the word, really wants the word. And I found myself there, too. So, so this isn't some accusation. This is just how we are as sinful human beings. And so, so really look at this. Now, we said that we take Scripture in big bites, like big chunks like this, because ultimately we want, now you judge you, judge you here. We want our lives to reform and conform according to the mind of Christ. 
The obvious question is, do you really think, I mean, no, one's, no one can see inside your brain right now. It's just you and God. Do you really want your life to reform and conform, not according to secular thought or not according to worldly philosophy, not even according to the cute ideas of the preacher, but rather according to the mind of Christ? Because if that's truly what you want, praise God for that, but things are about to get real serious in warfare real quick. That's, those two go together. Okay? Number two, we said 1 Corinthians is at its core a letter of instruction written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the middle of a sexually perverted. Now listen, because you might think we confuse Corinth with America. In the middle of a sexually perverse, pagan, idolatrous, tolerant, and relativistic culture. Those cultural dynamics made it a difficult place to minister, talking about Corinth, and maintain any sense of unity. Why? Because there was always another paradigm, philosophy, uh, or lust pulling at the church. Are are y'all okay? In other words, the church was always being pulled. No, no, it's okay to still eat in the idol's temple. No, no, it's okay if we're drunk at at the love feast after the Lord's table. No, no, it's okay if the man has his father's wife. No, no, it's okay if if I wear my Apollo shirt and you wear your Paul shirt. Let your mind go back to what we learned through 1 Corinthians, okay? And so there's always something then pulling at, 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 at this church. And in the middle of all of that, Paul proclaims a God-given standard in key areas, areas in which we still struggle today. And as we read and study this letter, this is what we wrote. This was at least my expectation. I expect CRCC will be exhorted by the Spirit of God to reform more and more as we bring ourselves further under apostolic teaching, written by the Spirit of God himself. And I believe that's exactly what has happened. We have been exhorted to reform more and more. Indeed, uh, some of us have really, many of us have really grown, and we're grateful for that. Let's look at the text today. Paul concludes the letter. As he does, he writes a few personal notes, as he is often, or as he often does uh, in some of his other epistles as well. In this case, he gives an update on Apollos, exhortations, uh, to be subject to and recognize leaders like Stephanus and others. And he reads greetings from close friends like Killa and Prisca, also known as Priscilla, and the church that met in their home. He encourages unity displayed by a holy kiss, and he warns the church to love the Lord or be accursed. Hermeneutically, let me say as we take a look at these final greetings, That it is always good to consider the genre of a scripture text when interpreting. Being able to discern the didactic or the teaching portions versus the personal greeting sections uh, as we are looking at today keeps us out of trouble. And in essence, it keeps us from being too dogmatic. Clearly, Stephanus, Fortunaeus, what's that that boy's name again? Say it. Who said it? Achaeus. I don't know why I want to say Achaicus. <laughs> but clearly, those brothers are dead, right? And so we can't we can't treat the scripture like they're alive, and we and we need to go honor them because they're with the Lord. Obviously, this is a greeting, and so we wouldn't try to recognize them, nor do we expect Timothy to come walking through the door. Okay. And so as you look at these greetings, that when it gets personal, uh, we, we begin to look at the Scripture and say, okay, now let's glean the principles from what is being said. And, and in that light, I would like to present to you for your focus today, verses 13 and 14 from the ESV. It says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. And ladies, you're not excluded. He was talking primarily to men because men lead the church. And this would have been this letter would have been read by men, uh, but the principle applies to everybody. It's not like men are supposed to be strong and the ladies aren't supposed to be strong. Okay, so be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. Somebody say in love. So that's our 
now, now again, we've kind of taught this a little bit recently. There's a similar verse uh, a, a chapter ago where he talked about be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. And then if you go back a couple more chapters, we talked about love. So, you know, we've kind of got this. But what I, by principle, what I would like you to do is look at verses 13 and 14 today and then get personal. As a matter of fact, look at number four. Here's the way I'd like you to approach this passage today as we do our quiz. Personally. Somebody say personally. In other words, as we walk through, review the 10 verses that we pulled out when we started and said, these verses are emblematic of what we'll learn and what we'll be exhorted towards in 1 Corinthians. I would like you to look at our text today and ask yourself, in these key areas that we were supposed to learn, have I been watchful? Have I applied my faith? Have I grown in maturity? Am I doing all of these things in love? Because otherwise, in other words, I want to tie a little bow on the end of this book, but I want to do it in a way that causes us to examine ourselves. I just don't want to say, wait, we came to 1 Corinthians, what do you learn? I don't know. I mean, I really want us to go back and, and look again and say, okay, have we really pressed ourselves to obey the Scripture, and then have we done that with love, right? And so I'd like you to approach this very personally today, hence the quiz. You'll see in a moment what I mean by that. Uh, Paul has taught this church much in this letter. They were to stand firm in the faith that they received the word. Ask yourself personal questions as we go through this today. Have you received the word? What Paul taught requires maturity, acting like men and not boys, acting like women and not girls. Have you matured? How many of you know that growth is intentional? If you didn't know, let me just state it. It's actually one of our core values. Growth is intentional. You got to want it. I'm not talking about, you know, being this tall and then being this tall, because all you got to do is eat and drink water. But how many of you have seen a tall, older person who needs to mature? Okay, so there is, a, there, is an, there is an intentionality then to, how many of you go after God's word? Don't raise your hand, but think about it. Go after God's word. Okay, this is the word of God. This is the word of my Lord. This is what my God wants for me. This is the kind of husband he wants me to be. This is the kind of wife he wants me to be. And then your flesh automatically fires up. Mm, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do this. And I don't want to do the other thing. Blah, 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 blah. And then you have a moment where you can grow or not. That's how this works. And in our society, we're, we're used to so much pseudo-intellectualism that there's a whole lot of folk who are very small in spiritual matters, but because they know a bunch of big words, they think they're big in spiritual matters. I'll take the one who learned how to love his enemy over somebody's the thesaurus still walking in disobedience. I believe it was God who said, I desire obedience rather than sacrifice. In other words, I want to see you mature. And, and I think most of us are the same way. I would rather my daughter obey me than do a bunch of stuff for me walking in disobedience. She washed the dishes, but she didn't do what I told her to do. She cleaned her room. But I had told her to do X, Y, and Z. And she says, no, hey, I didn't do that, but I cleaned my room. Okay? And so I want you to approach that today. But let's go ahead and get the, get the self-evaluation thing going and see how we do. Uh, Paul essentially reformed the church in critical areas and called them to be strong in the doing. May I ask you, as we look at this personally today, are you strong in the doing? Look, Remember, our text today for focus is... Uh, is uh, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. And so I ask you, are you strong in the doing? You don't just, you, you, you didn't just learn something about marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, but it's been grafted in. And you are, and you are working to be strong in the doing. You just, you, didn't learn, you just didn't, you know, intellectually perceive something about sexual immorality in chapter 6, but it affected you powerfully, and now you are working to be strong in the resisting of temptation. Y'all get where I'm coming from today? 
No? Okay, so, so but see, because this, this is how we grow. This is how we follow hard after our Lord. And so, D, for those standing firm in faith, maturing and walking in strong obedience, even if you got all of that, are you doing all of that in love? Or have, have you allowed haughtiness and pride to impact you? Because you can be doing the right things with the wrong attitude. Therefore, all things must be done in love, according to our emphasis today. And so I couldn't think of a better way than to, than to apply the principles of our, of our text today, verses 13 and 14, than to track all the way back to June of last year, pull those 10 passages again, look at what we said we were going to learn, how we prayed, all of that, and then give ourselves some self-evaluation on how we did. So y'all ready for the quiz? Okay, here we go. Back in, on June 2nd, 2013, we, we mentioned 10 key passages around 10 key themes that 1 Corinthians could teach us. And so let's see how we did. What I want you to do, if you have your notes and you have something to write with, as we talk through each one briefly, I want you to rate yourself 1 through 10 on the side of your paper. Nobody gets to see your paper unless they cheat and sit next to you. And don't worry, you're not turning it in. No, this is all for you. But I wanted you to, I want you to do this honestly. I want you to do this. Now, the number really doesn't mean anything, but what it's meant to do is cause you to think. Have I, have I, have I tried to be strong here? Have, have I tried to apply my faith here? Have I tried to, have I matured here? Am I still acting like a boy or girl? And am I, am I walking in love in these areas? So we're tying it all together with these last few verses, Okay. So here's number one. Y'all, y'all, uh, y'all going to write with me? Now, don't just give yourself straight tens. Because some of y'all are right, ten, 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 okay, nine and a half. No, no, no. Think it through. Think it through, okay? Because then you can add it all up at the end and see how you did, all right? Number one, we said that 1 Corinthians was supposed to help us be more unified because it dealt with church divisions. There's your fill in divisions. And so one of the things that was supposed to come out of it was supposed to be more unity. <laughs> ah! First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree Can I just lay down and go to sleep now? And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be unified in the same mind and the... Help me, Elizabeth. (laughs) You know you was thinking it. I'm, I'm coming to join you. Our prayer, we pray at the time was, Lord, may you cause our, (laughs) Lord, may you cause our homes and church to become more unified as we study this letter. May we love one another better, serve together better, and unite around the mind of Christ. So how did we do? Did we watch in this area to make sure that we were fostering unity? Did we apply our faith to things we didn't fully understand? Are we stronger in love and in unity because we prayed that this would happen for us? Go ahead and mark yourself down. How did you do here? How did you do? Were you one pushing people together, helping, serving, blessing, so that the reformation that God is trying to work through us and so many others will come to pass? Dealing with church division. (laughs) Number two. 
How'd you do on that first one? Anybody score a 10? Because I need to, if you scored a 10, I'm going to need you to come preach. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, preaching the gospel. Y'all remember this message? Remember, we just, we, these were key themes throughout the book. Preaching the true gospel. Preaching the true gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18 declares, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is what? It is the power of God. Our prayer at the time, this is not a long message today, by the way, our prayer at the time was, Lord, may CRCC preach Christ and him crucified, regardless of the cost. And may you save many and give us victory over our spiritual enemies in the process. What do you think? Remember, we're looking at this personally. What do you think? How did you do in the preaching of the gospel, in your ability to remain focused on the gospel, in your willingness to view life through the lens of the gospel, in your presentation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and God the Son, in your understanding that the law of God calls our sin exceedingly sinful and without repentance there can be no salvation, no remission of sin. How did you do as a blood-bought, sanctified believer in causing the gospel to be central, promoting the gospel in your homes, discipling people through and for and in the gospel of Christ. Go ahead and write it down. Write it on the side. Right or left, it don't matter. Nobody's collecting it. What do you, what do you think? And then because the goal here today is not condemnation, it's to, it's to cause some self-evaluation. If we're going to go into 15 and pull this conference off, and all the praying that needs to happen, and, the, and, and all, it's so much that in the enemies that need to be fought in the spiritual Oh, CRCC, please hear me. This, this, is real, this is real church. There's real stuff going on. This ain't, this ain't a bake sale. This is not the Rotary Club. This is not a club. I mean, lives are at stake, and there are serious churches in the land trying to get this done. So I, it's just a, a matter then of, a, of self-evaluation this morning. Just pray about it and talk to yourself as you write the number down, and then you you, you pray about where you are tonight in your own time with the Lord. Number three, are y'all with me? Remember, now the goal here is to look at our principles here. Strength, faith, maturity, and love. And then apply those things personally as we look at what we should, how we could have grown from this epistle. Number three, confronting arrogance and administering church discipline. Confronting arrogance and administering <laughs> church discipline. 1 Corinthians 4 says, uh, verses 5 through 6, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Amen. That none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Amen. Also, continuing the theme in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 through 5, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day or in the day of the Lord, in the day of the Lord. And so our prayer, as we consider that in the New Testament church, according to the pattern, there was discipline. Somebody say discipline. We admitted at the time, I remember this very distinctly, I, I, I admitted that this is probably my, my weakest area as a preacher, as a pastor, uh, because everything about it is, is contrary to modern church culture, by it, and all of us have been affected in some way or another by modern church culture. So our prayer was, Lord, humble us under your hand and show us how to conform to discipline you have commanded in love. In other words, show us how to lovingly and with a restorative, redemptive motive Hold one another accountable for what you have said. This one is hard to discern because discipline is rarely public, but I ask you anyway to think about any relationships in your life where you have, okay, in love, in faith, in strength, in maturity, 
held someone loving, lovingly accountable. And, and then here's the second part to that, as you, before you write your number, and allowed yourself, somebody say yourself, to be lovingly held accountable. One of the quickest ways to run somebody out your church is to tell them no. It is unbelievable. You can say it with a smile, too. Hey, I love you. I love you. My answer is no, but I love you. Gone. So, that, so if that's true on the pastoral side, I wonder how, what, what's happening, you know, just as Christian to Christian. A no doesn't mean somebody don't love you. Are you able then to receive correction? People say, I, know, I want you to correct me. You know, if you really, if you see anything in me that needs to be adjusted, I need, need you to just, you know, come tell me. As easier as one of them true ones, it's easier said than done for all of us. And so what I, I tell you what I've done, and it ain't easy, but what, I, what I've tried to do is build into my life specific times of the year where I text my pastor and say, now, I need to hear the correction. I, I just need, I need you to just lay it out. And then we do it in the office, too. What, what, what? Do you see? What, what, what are you? Ba, 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 ba. Because this is a mark of maturity. So, and it's part of this whole mindset of having church discipline in the church. Most people think of church discipline, and they think of, we're going to bring somebody in, in the front. And Okay, yeah, that's part of it in certain circumstances. But the theme that you, the thing that you really want to grab is, are you able to be corrected? Can you, are you willing to submit yourself to your brother or sister for accountability? And it's quiet in the building. Yeah. Okay. And so may I submit to you that if we aren't willing to be corrected and we aren't willing to even allow the word to correct us, that there's an issue of pride that we need to deal with before the Lord. Number four, fleeing sexual immorality. This is a big theme in 1 Corinthians of purity. Somebody say purity. Purity is a huge, I mean, I mean literal, literal physical purity is a huge theme in 1 Corinthians. So we, we pull this verse out just to make the point and to see the theme. Uh, Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Somebody say flee. What does flee mean to you when someone's fleeing? Is, it, is this fleeing? Anybody think that's fleeing? How about this? Okay, let's make sure we understand. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Our prayer was simple. Can anyone help me pray this prayer? Purify us, O Lord. Everybody deals with this in some way, in some form, at some point. And so our prayer was purify us from, from the inside out. Help us to be pure. We sang the song this morning, holiness, right? Holiness is what I long for. Let's see. Um, the culture that we live in, is the most, in my opinion, immodest culture since the ancient Greeks and Romans. Because I'm trying to choose language that doesn't sound legalistic. Most of us have been impacted by standards that are inappropriate to the point where we have been so desensitized by it that we have come to think it's appropriate. Without giving you any specific instruction, at, I'm encouraging you to at least acknowledge that we have a purity problem. From the way we present ourselves, 
to what we allow to come before our eyes to sometimes, sadly, even how we bring ourselves to worship. Flee was the command. So in faith, in in strength, in maturity, and in love, ask yourself, okay? Ask yourself, are you stronger here? Have you grown intentionally here? Because we we taught through the Holy Spirit's commandments to flee here. It's not, this isn't something where, where whether you've been perfect, it's whether or not you've grown. It's whether you see things differently, because that's what the preaching of the word is supposed to do. And the receiving of the word, so, so we, have we grown? And then, in a D6 church like ours, are you teaching your children to grow? To guard? To be, di- okay, may, y'all are looking at me funny. How many of you want your children to be just like any other child in the world? None. Good. That means they ought to f- Think different. Somebody say amen. Amen. That means they ought to process life different because they're doing it through the lens of the gospel. Somebody say amen. Amen. And saints, truth be told, if that's what's happening on the inside, they'll probably talk and sound and look different. I'm, I'm not trying to raise a thug. I don't want him to talk like a thug. I don't want him to dress like one either. You'll have a belt. It'll be on in the proper place. That's just me in my house. You do what you want to. I'm not trying to raise two hoochies. Let's not fuss about the, the lasciviousness of the world and then raise them up. Talking about legalism. Listen, can I just, obeying Scripture, the principles, the precepts, and the patterns of Scripture is not legalism. Legalism is when you go beyond what is written. So in this church, we're very careful to tell you, here's what the Bible says. Now you go and you do what you do. But at the same time, let's not act like there's not a problem. So 1 Corinthians could help us grow in holiness in this area. Are are y'all tracking with me? Okay. It's it's, it's just that simple. Now, nowhere in, I told you what what I'm trying to do. You have to write, write your number. What are you trying to do? How, did you grow in this area? Did you, did you, did you, did you, are you, wow, did you see something a little different here? Um, it's a tough area because we're, it's so, we're so saturated in it that any righteous standards just sound ridiculous. So it's, it's hard to even preach because it, I know it sounds ridiculous. So because we're so immersed all the time in, in, in modesty. Okay, uh, number five. How are we doing so far? Anybody got uh, 40%? Four tens? Anybody got four tens? Okay. <laughs> Number five, building right views on singleness and marriage. Building right views on singleness and marriage. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptations to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You read that whole chapter to get a sense of what Paul was saying there, because there are principles from both sides on both the married and the unmarried. But my, qu- my our prayer was, Lord, protect our homes. So home means where you live, regardless of your state, right? Protect our homes was our prayer, okay? Our prayer was push the enemy away from every marriage. Push the enemy away from every single person. Give us the strength to walk in love and holiness. We're, th- that all, that prayer came out of something that the Spirit presents through 1 Corinthians for us over and over again. And so our prayer was protect our homes. How'd you do? Because this battle right here is raging as we speak. And then maybe go a little further. What can you do now to better protect your marriage or your holiness as an unmarried person? Okay. Is it wise if you're unmarried, to spend all night reading romance novels? Is it wise if you're married to hang out with old girlfriends from the past? Of course not, okay? Um, But you make those decisions. So um, 
What are you going to do if you're married? Here's a way that you can write your number. What are you going to do with your marriage right now? Are you a five husband, six husband, seven husband, eight husband? And I'll, I'll let you cheat on this one. If your spouse is here, let them see what you wrote by this one. Because you might have nine and then you might have this mark go across it right quick and get like a 3.5. <laughs> Something. So, but, but, but what are you going to do here? Because, again, we're talking about the home and the home is the foundation of the kingdom. It's, it's out of the home should come so much jurisdictionally, as we've said over and over again. And so are you being watchful here? Are you being prayerful here? Are you on your job here? Brothers, are you leading here well? Uh, if, you're, if you're married, particularly, you know, are you, are you doing catechism? Are you, are you doing devotions? Are you, today you should be in Proverbs 14. Are you still tracking with us? Right? Ladies, are you tracking with us? Right? So what are you doing there? Okay. Number seven. Everybody okay? Okay. So we're in, uh, no, six. Six. Warnings against idolatry. Warnings against idolatry. From 1 Corinthians 10, there was a lot on idolatry in here, by the way, from chapters 8, 9, and 10. I mean, there was just a ton on warning this church away from other gods and the worship of other gods and the participation with the worship of other gods. I mean, it was a ton. We, we, it's, we took, it was several weeks in idolatry, if you recall, just, just trying to understand what was being said there. So he warns against idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 through 11. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ, what, to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Here was our prayer a year and a half ago. Oh, Lord. May this series help us ensure that you alone receive our worship. Simple prayer. This is an area that is always, always going to be a, a struggle and a fight. So I don't even know really how to say it other than examine yourself here. Examine yourself and see how you're doing in this area of pulling yourself away from that which shames and denigrates and makes mockery of and fights against our Lord. And putting yourself in place, in position to where Christ alone receives your worship, your attention, uh, and his commandments, his word, then becomes the standards by which you live. I don't even know really kind of how to say that, but, but think about how you're doing here as a Christian. This is your, this is your walk. How you doing? How you, how you doing? Okay, and then what can you do better? How do you want to go into next year? Do you have any repenting you need to do in this area? Every one of these areas I had re some repenting to do, so... Um, you might as well. Okay. Number seven, modesty and gender roles. Modesty and gender roles. From 1 Corinthians 11, we at, uh, at back in June 2nd, we pulled out verses 2 and 3. You might recall. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of, her, the head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Our prayer was at the time, Father, Help us raise up, not ours, okay, your loving standards for men and women according to your will and according for not our hurt but our good. Have you watched here? Because remember our principles. Have you watched? Have you been watchful? Have you grown in strength in understanding the intrinsic differences in terms of biology between men and women and in terms of jurisdiction and role between men and women? I know the culture wants you to be androgynistic. I know the culture is blurring the lines between male and female. Literally, there are schools in our nation where if, if a boy goes to school, but he feels like a girl that day, he can go to the girl's bathroom. There's, there's things that are happening in our nation right now that are so perverse and, and flow out of such a rejection of, of who God is that I, it's hard to even even communicate it, but the, there's, a, there's a definite war going on with this male, female, husband, wife, men and women uh, thing. It is a war happening, and 
I do you no favors by getting up here and sugarcoating that. Your children are going to grow up with everybody under the sun trying to get them confused about being a boy or a girl or a girl or a boy or a Merle or whatever. And parents, you are the front line. You better get it. You better get it. You better better watch this television. You better watch the computer. You better watch the cell phone. You better teach, 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 teach. If you got boys, you better figure out manhood quickly. Model it and teach it. If you got girls, you better figure out womanhood quickly. Model it and teach it. It is a nightmare in this area and getting not better right now, but worse exponentially worse. And this is the th- see, I was, I'm trying to be nice today, but, but man, <laughs> this thing has got the church back on her heels. There are people in big pulpits equivocating and waffling here in the name of love like you would never imagine. People you would never think, dude, stand up and preach the Bible, man. Stand up and preach the Bible. You're not helping anybody with fake love. You're not helping anybody with love that's not love. Remember, CRCC, love must be lawful. If love is not lawful, it's not love, it's perverse. Just like, that's just like law has to have love. If law doesn't have love, it's pharisaical. So love needs law and law needs love. It's not either or, it's both. So you better, you better get this one. You better get this one. If you got, listen, I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm trying to help. If you got your kids in public schools, you better figure out what's being taught. And for some of y'all who got your kids in Christian schools, you better figure out what's being taught. Because, man, Christian schools are starting to trip. So, so, I mean, just because they got a cross on the outside doesn't seem to mean anything these days. And so you better figure out if somebody's teaching it, you know. I mean, what was the one I saw recently? Oh, the gender-bred man. person, excuse me, the gender, the gender bread, is that right, Don, uh, uh, Pastor Rodney, person. There was a, there was a school with, a, and I don't know where exactly where they were, it was in California, there was a school where, where, the, where the, some parents got mad because in the classroom, the teachers had introduced to very, you know, reasonably young children that they could pick their gender. And one of the ways they were, were explaining that, you go Google it. Some of y'all will today. One of the ways they were explaining that in the school was they had a diagram of the gender-bred person. Now, I don't know about y'all, but don't mess with the gender-bred man. <laughs> Anybody, y'all remember ginger snaps? Listen, don't mess with the ginger, uh, some cold milk, don't mess. You know, sometimes you got to laugh to keep from crying. You got to throw a joke in there just to keep yourself going. Not, I'm not, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to lie to you in the pulpit, right? Just go look for yourself. But, okay, so this, this modesty piece, this gender piece, did we grow in 1 Corinthians? Were we watchful? Did we apply our faith? Did we apply our strength? Did we mature? And then how we loved others through it. Number eight, spiritual gifts and their purpose. First Corinthians 12 says, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Spiritual gifts and their purpose. Our prayer was, Lord, help us incorporate these blessed gifts more into the life of our church for your glory, and for the building up of your house. This is one of the areas where you know, there's obviously a lot of controversy uh, in the church over spiritual gifts, and that's just, just going to continue. But, you know, from my perspective, I'm just always amazed at all the solar scripture of people who aren't so solar when you get to 1 Corinthians 14. I just, I, that always baffles my mind, because uh, I'm a solar scripture guy, and I'm like, huh, hello, you know, same hermeneutics, what are you doing? Okay, so anyway, uh, our prayer was, Lord, grow us and make us stronger. All, everybody in the room has, if you're a Christian, you got something. You know, if, if you're not a tongue talker, you might be uh, someone who discerns well. If you're not a discerning person, you might be a musician. If you're not a musician, you might be 
someone whose faith is just through the roof and, and you need to talk to uh, most of us whose faith gets a little down sometimes and encourage us in the Lord. May I encourage this church that as you have been gifted to use those gifts, is that, is that a fair encouragement? Can you, can, you just, can you just use what you've been given? If you, if you are good at whatever, if you have been blessed with whatever, if, if you, you get up in the middle of the night and God has spoken, can you tell somebody? Can you come holler at us and let us bet you through? Because you may have something for us. If, you, you know, if you're a teacher, can, can, we, can we get you in position? Or are you at least teaching in your home? I mean, you know, if whatever, whatever it is, may I encourage you to use your gifts? May I, my, may I discourage you from just sitting down and getting a word? Because sitting down and getting the word, you do that long enough, you know what you will become? You become a Pharisee. It, it's, so, it's hard not to when all you do is sit and critique what's being said. But I want to encourage you, use your gifts. Because look, this was our prayer. Our prayer was, Lord, help us incorporate what you've given us into the life of the congregation. This isn't a one-man band. We need one another. And so, have we the faith the strength and the maturity to press forward in using what the Lord has given us. And he's given you something. He's probably given you more than one something. May I encourage you to use it. Number nine, order in the church. <laughs> what then, brothers? Brothers. When you come together, each has a, a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. We spent a lot of time there, that whole piece of building up. You might recall that. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each, and each in turn let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. And then uh, everybody's favorite series of verses, verse... <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 through 35. We pulled it out way back then. We knew we were in trouble. Okay. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Context there is authoritative speaking, but they should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman then to speak in church. It was shameful for a woman to come and take authority in the church. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But all things should be done how? Decently and in order. Our prayer at the time was, Lord, we don't have the right to establish our own order. You've already done that. Help us to learn and help us to conform. I'm just wondering if I can get to the exit which aisle I have to go down. <laughs> I, t <laughs> I told um, I, I've, I've told several people this, but you know that you're in trouble or you know that there's work that has to be done when the mere reading of certain scripture elicits negative feeling. We trust the word. So, how do we do here? Our prayer, again, was we don't have the right to establish our own or, or done that to help us to learn and conform. Have you done that in love? Have you done that with maturity? Have you pressed forward in this area of figuring out that although we all have something that we bring, God has set the church up like he set the home up. And he set the plan, he set the order, and we bring ourselves underneath what he said, not what we've said. I will just be transparent with you. Uh, this area here of gender and authority and all that in first Corinthians really pushed our church really tested us badly uh, I'm, I'm well aware that you can go most places down the street and they would just gloss over all of this and it doesn't mean you know, ba -ba -ba. And even though and so the, the, there's this hypocrisy in hermeneutics right we we take this as written 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 we don't like this so we're going to make allowance for this not to be true but then we're going to take this is written and take this is written and take this is written and take this is written. And that's just foolishness. Can't do that. Got to be consistent. So um, how, we, how have we done here? 
Um, I, I, I give myself a low grade here. I don't know if I loved hard enough through all of that, and forgive me if I didn't. From head coverings through, through, fir- through chapter 11, I don't know if I gave enough of myself to help us understand those difficult passages. So please forgive me if I've done some harm there, because I know it's hard. Uh, and then what are you going to do now? How have we done? Uh, have we loved un- one another through it all? Um, what do you think? Put your number down. Can, may, I, may I ask something, though? Can I ask that if we do anything from this point forward, we just raise the love up? I mean, could you, can you take your current love level and just, like, double it? Because how, you, how a church grows when the, when the Spirit through the Apostle is saying, bang, 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 is you love each other through as you are all, everyone tries to bring themselves under what it says. And so may I just ask, can, can I just ask you to love a little harder, love a little better, love a little more intentionally? You know it ain't right that you ain't picked up that phone and called that person in a year. And y'all used to be like that. You know, ain't nothing right about that. Ain't no God in that nowhere. Come on now. So can we, can we love a little harder? Okay. Number 10. We pull this one out too, understanding the resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised and your faith is futile, you're still in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have this hope or have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, if in fact, goodness, I can't read. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ. Guess what, dear friends? shall all be made alive. Our prayer at the time was, Lord, help us to live with the joy of the resurrection and an eternal perspective. Hopefully, prayerfully, your joy has risen as you have brought yourself underneath the word of God more and more and looked with a keen eye towards heaven and not earth. It will, it, joy will begin, and then every time I get a little flustered, get a little frustrated, I'm trying to learn how to do this. I'm trying to press my way into doing this because it's not easy to say, okay, Lord, all this is happening, but one day the sky will crack. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will rise. We will receive the end of our salvation, literally our souls, and, and we'll be reunited with our bodies if we were already dead. But if we're here, we'll be caught up and our bodies will be transformed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so you begin to live for that day And as you begin to live for that day, it helps you with the now. It helps you to live a life that honors Christ because you you start to lose concern about what the world thinks. And you start to be more concerned about what God thinks. You you, you lose some of this, I got to please the world. And you gain some of this, I must please the God who saved me. So our prayer was, Lord, help us again to live with the joy of the resurrection and an eternal perspective. Write your number in. You got a number in there? Got a number in there? Is the strength of your joy stronger? And if not, may I ask or, you know, give you something to think about? Why? Because if you're waiting for circumstances to improve to have joy, you know you're on a roller coaster, right? Well, I mean, as soon as this job comes through, I'm going to have joy. Okay, but then you could lose that job. And I hope you get the job. Praise God. But if your joy is tethered to something that can be so easily taken. Well, as soon as my husband starts acting right, I'm going to have joy. Whoa. I want him to act right. He better act right. We need him to be transformed by the power of the gospel from the inside out and begin to conform to, to the principles of Scripture. But, my dear sister, if you're saved, you need the joy of the Lord that's your strength to even deal with him. You need to go and get in your closet and look again at the coming of our Lord, at the work of our Lord at the finished work of our Lord, at the suffering of our Lord, at the blood shed by our Lord. And then hopefully that will spur you. You want the same thing with husbands to wives, same thing, okay? So is your joy stronger? Is your faith stronger? Are you more looking forward to his coming? And then as the old preachers used to say, and how do you want to be found? Listen, Elder Rose, when he sings, well, when he sings, period, there's an anointing. There's something that I, I don't even... God has really gifted him. But when he stands up and goes, holiness, holiness, 
is what I long for. I can't do it like him. Holiness is what I need. You know, every time, as beautiful as that sounds, you know what I think? You know what I think? I think, Lord, but can I sing that with my whole heart? And do I want to be found by you in holiness? In other words, not to earn you, because I can never earn you, but I love you so much that will I be found in holiness? Have I pressed through my, some of my immaturities to where now I see holiness as an honor and a privilege before God? Listen, this is one of the main challenges in our church right now, spiritually speaking. And it applies across so many different areas. Please hear me right now. If you have tuned me out, everything else, check in here now so we can get this, okay? And one of the main challenges of our church is we've, we've had the temerity to declare that we want to live for God and we want to live in righteousness for God. And we hope that through that, God will reach and teach and release so many different people. But now, CRCC, the little soul of scripture, a church that wants to walk in the power of the Spirit and wants to be holy, is being checked. Did you really think we were going to declare that in the Spirit and then not be tested? So now, who are we? Who are we? I believe what I heard in my spirit this morning, that God is, he's making us into what he wants us to be. How many of you ever played, Lord, prayed this prayer, Lord, mold me? Let me see your hands. Be bold with it. Come on, wave at me. You've ever prayed, Lord, mold me, Lord, shape me? Anything that sounds like that. Okay. Do you know what molding and shaping is? Any artists in the room? Molding and shaping is when you grab something. Oh, wow, I I really did tear that. (laughs) Didn't mean to really tear it, right? Okay, no, no. I need need something. Okay. (laughs) So we, we pray for that stuff. Make me. Okay, in the oven maybe, in the fire. So that's what we're, so we're, we're, that's where we, we're being, okay. And, and we're being, we're being tested. Holy? Really? Faithful? Really? Okay. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a really, really, really good thing. And so let your joy, I hope your joy is pressing into this, this place of, Doing what, he, doing what he said, being faithful to what he's given. There's something precious happening here. That's not, it doesn't come from any man. It doesn't come from any human's ability. But there's something real pure trying to break out. Let it. Let God do this work in us. And I'm, I'm almost done. A few personal lessons. Right now, I'm in this, I think I'm about, I'm, I'm getting a C-ish, it looks like, in mine here. Somewhere in a C range, high D maybe. <laughs> a few personal lessons. One, I've learned how wonderful it is when God's people allow Scripture to change them. The McLeod family has mar- markedly shifted through 1 Corinthians, as many of your families as well. And I'm just amazed that God loves us so much that he would give us any ability at all to conform to what he said. Two, I've learned that sometimes obeying scripture is just flat hard. And there are going to be some gut checks on this journey with the Lord. There's no other way around it. I've also learned that there's a such thing as fake maturity. I've seen it in my own life, and I hate it. And i got to get it out of there. Number three, I reaffirm that spiritual warfare is real. Satan despises a church that is open to be changed by the spirit and the letter and will attack it relentlessly. We've warned you and warned you. It's just the truth. Four, I've learned that the battle, that our battle with being concerned about what the world thinks is harder than we think. There's a lot there. We could preach for weeks on that, but it's just really, really the truth. Number five, I've learned that God is faithful through it all, who will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide, guess what, dear friends, a way of escape. That you may be able, what? To endure it. Our final prayer. May we always have a heart to obey Christ and grow in his grace. Let us be watchful. Let us stand firm. Let us be mature.